you know, in the old days, it was really bad politically to be on the talking down America side of things. I believe yeah. we Republicans, when we were Republicans, did a fair amount of attacking Democrats for that. And uh, Gene Kirkpatrick in the 84 speech at the Reagan convention way back when, uh, they always blame America first. Now it's totally standard, don't you think, conservative MAGA talking point. Oh, yeah. Hello and welcome to the Bullard Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. We have 217 days to the 2024 election. It's Monday. I'm back with Bill Crystal. Bill, how are you doing? Fine, Tim. How are you? I'm doing quite well, and I am excited. We, we have to start with the most important news of the day, which isn't about politics. We have I, I, what I expect will be the most watched women's college basketball game in history tonight, a rematch of last year's national championship, Caitlin Clark's Iowa Hawkeyes against the LSU Tigers, who were demeaned as dirty debutantes in the LA Times, who were assaulted by a profile writer who, who didn't understand Kim Mulkey's resilience in the Washington Post. I like you, Kent Babb. That's just a joke. And, uh, you know, they've been, they've, we, we've been, you know, kind of turned this into a, you know, goodness versus darkness, you know, the, in the evil empire, the LSU Tigers defending their title. Should be a marvelous basketball game tonight. How, how Are you excited? Uh, I'm not really, but I'm at the, at the bulwark. Many people in the bulwark are. The bulwark is divided, a house divided against itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you and your family there rooting for the Tigers and Andrew Egger and his family. I think his wife went to Iowa uh, very much. Uh, he told me he was dressing the little, the toddlers uh, and the infant up in Hawkeye's gear. So it's interesting be, how we you, fit. You, in you guys can, you guys can hash it out tomorrow for probably, I think maybe a special three or four hour, probably a special podcast, three or four think. hour yeah. uh, breakdown of the elite eight match tonight. Probably uh, it's at seven in the East. If you're looking for uh, when to tune in, uh, I will say it's interesting how the, you know, kind of the narrative and the, uh, the, the, uh, stereotypes of the teams are reflected in the Bulwark House Divided. You know, people say the Iowa team is like milk and cookies, you know, <laughs> America's girls. That's kind of Andrew Egger. You know, the LSU team was slandered as dirty debutantes. I think I fit that role pretty nicely. So it, it is nice that even internally we're, we're living to type. So uh, we're pulling for Angel Reese and Flage Johnson tonight, and, and I hope everybody enjoys that basketball, take a break from politics. Enjoy that basketball game totally. here on Monday night. I, I think it's wonderful for the for the sport, and uh, I'm excited. I got I'll have my little girl out in LSU gear tonight. I'm not going to tell you guys what bar I'm going to be at because you know I, I, we don't we don't need mobs of mobs of fans coming to to bother us in the in the middle of this important match. But I, just, just, I watched. <laughs> I watched Duke last night out of loyalty to our daughter who, and son-in-law who went there. And I'm like the only person outside of Durham who actually roots for Duke out of that family loyalty. But anyway, it was they, tough. It was after tough after getting there as a four seed and having a kind of clear path, right? They had four seed playing at 11. How That doesn't happen that often. Yeah. They probably lost to North Carolina State. Tough loss. I also like that Jared McCain on Duke who, who paints his nails. He's got a good TikTok feed. I know we're not supposed to be on TikTok, but if you are secretly on TikTok, you should check out Jared McCain's TikTok. Okay, let's get to business. Well, this isn't really business, actually. We're going to slowly get into real business. You know, we'll, we'll go, we'll, go we'll, we'll begin with sports and then we'll go to the, the politics, the, the, the WWE element of politics, and we'll get into actual policy. Um, there was a kerfuffle over the weekend about, about Easter and about which, uh, you know, which candidate for president is, is more faithful, more reverent, takes Easter more seriously. Um, seems like it'd be an easy call between the weekly church going Catholic and the, uh, you know, guy who's cheated on all his wives and likes to play golf on Sundays, but, but not, on, not in conservative media. In conservative media, they were trying to spin it the other way and say that it was Joe Biden who was sacrilegious uh, because the White House put out a statement acknowledging the, tra a tra the transgender day of visibility, which has been on March 31st. They put out a statement every March 31st. It's just Easter changes. I know the the heathen the heathen Christians might not really realize that the you know the Eastern Catholic Christians don't, don't really Catholics don't really realize that the Easter does change days. So uh, they did not turn Easter into Transgender Day of Visibility. It just happened to land on Easter this year. Also, there was another controversy: um, uh, the White House Easter egg roll. Uh, they said they can't put any religious iconography. The children cannot draw any religious iconography on the eggs. Now, I, this does seem stupid to me. I concur that that seems very stupid. But here's the thing. it's That's been the rule for 45 years since 1976, including all the Easter egg rolls that Donald Trump was in there. Um, and so, 
You know, uh, this none of the facts, though, got in the way of, you know, basically a full outrage cycle. Governors, Governor of Mississippi, Tate Reeves, Fox News. This was wall to wall and Fox News, tan suit level coverage of, of these outrages on Fox News. Um, how, how do you assess this bill and, uh, and, how, and how do you even deal with nonsense like this? I mean, it's, it is hard to know. Just one other little factoid. You would feel stupid even talking, you know, in a way addressing it, but whatever. I mean, Joe Biden put out as this on Easter or for Easter this year, as he has, I gather the last past couple of years, quite a religious statement about the meaning of Easter. I mean, he is a serious Catholic and he talks about the resurrection and Jesus' sacrifice, which he's entitled to do certainly and did. So the idea that Joe Biden, uh, that Donald Trump takes the meaning of Easter more seriously than Joe Biden is obviously on its face ludicrous. Uh, and um, I can't, you know, the other thing that struck me about it, just kind of following it a bit this weekend is like back in the old days, i.e. 10 years ago, this, <laughs> like Fox News might have made something of this and Rush Limbaugh, talk radio. It's kind of a talk radio thing, right? A few backbench members of Congress, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of that day would have maybe said something. The idea that actual semi-serious politicians in semi-serious positions, you know, leadership roles in the House, governors of states would be addressing this, and pretending that it's a real thing. That's the real collapse of the Trump era. And of course, one shouldn't be surprised because Trump is in charge of the Republican Party and the three-time nominee, so why shouldn't everyone follow down his path? But the degree to which everyone is just following down his path is I don't know. It's not striking anymore, but it is noteworthy, I think. Uh, it is noteworthy. And Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, look at what everybody did. Governors. I thought, uh, you know, Jonathan Martin pointed this out this morning. Uh, you know, that's like, this would not, again, the, you're talking about backbenchers of the House. Even as recently as like three years ago, the idea right. that governors would engage in this kind of thing, like the governorships were sort of a, a you know, the, the National Governors Association, which is a bipartisan group, you know, still kind of existed as a pretty, you know, pretty useful bipartisan organization where they, you know, trade best practices, et cetera, et cetera. And this stuff is now trickling down everywhere. Uh, to your point on Joe Biden's statement, um, well, let's just read it together. Joe and I send our warmest wishes to Christians around the world celebrating the power of hope and the promise of Christ's resurrection this Easter Sunday. As we gather with loved ones, we remember Jesus' sacrifice. We pray for one another and cherish the blessing of the dawn of new possibilities. Um I want to read Donald Trump's statement in a second. It's a little different. Uh, but I had an event over the weekend. I, I was moderating a panel with um, with Reverend William Barber. Um, and, and one of the things I was asking him um, was, I, I do think that sometimes that the Democrats c could – you know, wear their religiosity on their sleeve. And we talked about, you You wrote, I think, well about Joe Lieberman over the weekend um, and his Jewish faith. Uh, Biden does this kind of, and I do wonder if there is an opening here just, you know, to kind of counter what I think is a wrong conventional wisdom that Democrats aren't comfortable talking about faith and religion as a contrast with Donald Trump in an election year, not saying that the Democrats should start grifting and selling Bibles, et cetera. But, uh, you know, is that is there, you know, a way to kind of swing the pendulum back a little bit with this? Is this something that Democrats should be just thinking about, uh, at least for Democrats for whom it's, it's gen a genuine and authentic belief? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. And as you say, Joe Biden is, is fairly you know, upfront. I wouldn't say he, he's not gratuitous in it, but he's a genuine church going Catholic. And obviously, maybe well, I was going to say maybe particularly since his son's death, but I don't even know that maybe forever, 40 years, 50 yeah. years. Uh, he's been he's been that. And so uh, it's very important to him, clearly. And and uh, that maybe people should talk about that more in those communities. There are also chances if one wants to get a little more God forbid, Machiavellian or, you know, sure. uh, on the level of operatives as opposed to the earnest politicians. That statement, was it Johnson, Speaker Johnson's statement to distinguish Catholics and Christians in that? Was that Johnson? Or was uh, that I believe else? that was actually a uh, Trump spokesman or spokeswoman, Caroline okay. Lovett, a failed congressional I'm sorry. Okay. So, yeah. Trump's, but that's okay. Speaking for Trump, though. Yeah. So that's an old fashioned Protestant view that, you know, we're the Christians and the Catholics are not really right. good Christians because they follow the Pope and Rome and yeah. all this stuff. I don't know. It feels like that's a relic of that in there, but maybe a bit of a dog whistle to parts of the uh, sort of extreme versions of the evangelical and, fun evangelical and really even more fundamentalist, right? And someone, I wouldn't, the campaign shouldn't do this, but some Biden supporter out there somewhere should start causing trouble among Catholics that, you know, these people don't think you're real Christians. Biden clearly thinks 
Biden uh, addresses all, all of us Christians at one point in one of his statements, or we Christians, right. yeah. you know. So he, he thinks Catholics are Christians. Uh, he does. Andrew Bates of the White House did put out a statement about that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, sometimes I think that not Biden and not Biden's team, really, but sometimes other Democrats, I feel like, seem a little uncertain, uncomfortable um, with uh, with religiosity and overt displays of it. And I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe some ads of, of Biden, of Biden in church what, probably wouldn't hurt either. Um, OK, just one more thing on the Easter uh, the Easter statement. Just just as a reminder for folks, it's Monday. You know, they, they might not have been paying attention. I just, one more time, Joe Biden's statement, as we gather with loved ones, we remember Jesus' sacrifice. That was a sentence from Joe Biden. Here is his opponent. Happy Easter to all, including crooked and corrupt prosecutors and judges that are doing everything possible to interfere with the presidential election and put me in prison, including those many people that I completely and totally despise because they want to destroy America, a now failing nation like deranged Jack Smith, who is evil and sick, Mrs. Fanny Fawny, Wade, it goes on. Um... <laughs> Speaking of deranged, uh, like what in the fuck? I guess what in the fuck is my question, Bill? It's a question that answers itself. <laughs> I, I like the fact that me is in the sort of third line of the statement. That's that somehow says it all too, right? I mean, well, let's forget about all that Jesus stuff here. You know? Talking about I'm me. Not give you a long commentary. Speaking of people who sacrificed on Easter weekend, let's talk about me. Let's make this. Yeah. Let's make Easter about me. What about the failing nation? element he just tosses that in there too a lot you know well that's because of, yeah no they are surprisingly and you know in the old days it was really bad politically to be on the talking down america side of things i believe yeah. we republicans when we were republicans did a fair amount of attacking democrats for that and uh gene kirkpatrick in the 84 speech at the reagan convention way back when uh they always blame america first now it's totally standard don't you think conservative maga talking point oh, yeah. that america is a total i mean, disaster, uh, made more so by Biden, but kind of a disaster anyway, because of all these trends that they hate. And that's why they root for, you know, for Russia against America, I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, in summation, the Donald Trump Easter experience was hating America, separating Christians and Catholics, and um, selling a grifty Bible to help for his legal troubles. And, and Joe Biden's Easter was attending mass and sending out a respectful statement about the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, we were texting this morning about some Senate polling. I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, it's worth spending a little time about. Um, th these, are the, these are polling averages, and, and some of this, um, you know, is related to, you know, we can take all this. You always take polling with a grain of salt, but in particular, some of these Senate races you can take with a grain of salt because there's a lot of undecided vote out there. But it's, it's still worth noting. If you look at Arizona right now, on the average, Trump is up four. Gallego is up three. Um, and so that means Kerry Lake is under polling Trump by four on the ballot and by seven by comparison. So Trump has 48, Kerry Lake 44. Um, in Montana, Trump is at 53, up by 20. Uh, the Montana Senate Republican, uh, Sheehy, is uh, down at 40%. So he's 13% less than Trump. He's losing to Tester by six. Uh, Ohio President Trump is at 50, uh, winning, beating Biden by 10. Bernie Moreno, um, the MAGA car dealer, uh, he's, he has a 37 on the ballot, and uh, he's losing by six. So Trump is outpulling him substantially as well. And Nevada, uh, the Nevada polling I don't really love, but it, the it, the same thing plays out here. Trump's at 47. The Nevada Senate candidate is at 37. Uh, Pennsylvania, I, I think, really good polling in Pennsylvania. This is a good, maybe a clearer example. Trump and Biden are tied. Bob Casey is leading Davos, Dave McCormick, by eight, 47 to 39. So it's just it's across the board. It's also true in Wisconsin. Trump and Biden are tied. Tammy Baldwin's winning by four. The, the, really, the, only, exam, the only counter example here is... Um, Maryland, St. Larry Hogan uh, is up by four currently in the polls and Biden is up by 19. So that's, I, I mean, I, it's, it's noteworthy. It's a trend. I and mean, I think that there are two ways to look at it. Maybe one is that it's concerning for Biden, right? That maybe there's something unique about Biden that people don't like. Maybe it's age, maybe it's something else. Um, or uh, maybe you can look at it about just kind of the weakness of, of how Trump has fractured the Republican Party 
you know, and and how it's hard to put uh, Trump is unique, really, in the way that he can put together that whatever this coalition is, the MAGA coalition. I don't know. How, how do you look at at those numbers? No, I think both are somewhat true. I mean, so strong Democratic incumbents, Casey in Pennsylvania, for example, who yeah. comes from a family of, you know, that's, that's dominated the Democratic politics or politics in Pennsylvania for decades, uh, are running ahead of Biden. Maybe that's not a surprise. The degree of running ahead in, in Pennsylvania, in Montana, in Ohio, those are states that Biden wouldn't win anyway, but just the, the, the delta, the gap there should be concerning for Biden. He's right. underperforming. He's an incumbent too, after all. Right. He's underperforming normally strong Democratic, I mean, strong Democratic incumbents, I would say, Tester and Brown, who are much better than a typical Democratic incumbent. I think Arizona is particularly interesting because they, and, and the other thing I would say is the Republicans aren't well known in some of those states. So you could argue once their name sure. ID gets up, they'll get closer to Trump's number. Arizona, Carrie Lake, does have 100% name ID. Everybody knows Carrie She lost by a very small margin in 2022. Trump won Arizona by a very small margin in 2020. So it's somewhat apples to apples in that case, I would say. Yep. And you began with Arizona. The fact that, that Trump is, that Carrie Lake, let's see, four, if I'm right, four yeah, so let's just, I'll just say these again so then you can kind of dig in yeah. on Arizona. So Gallego's at 47, Carrie Lake 44. So that is Gallego, the Democrat, plus three. And then the same average, Trump is at 48 Biden is at 44. Trump is plus four. So 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 it's a plus four Trump to minus three Lake, 48 for Trump, 44 for Lake. So think of it this way. 4% of Trump's 48% are deserting when they get to the Senate level and going over to Gallego, yeah. which is about one in 10, almost one in 11 or 12 Trump voters yeah. aren't sticking to, to vote for Gary Lake, right. which is a pretty big number, actually, at a, at a very polarized and partisan in the polarized and partisan world we live in. And it does, and Lake and Lake is a Trump favorite. So, I mean, it's not like there's a gap between the two particularly. Yeah, sure. And, and, and uh, so I think it shows that some of that Trump, uh, and it's sort of heartening in a way, some of that Trump support, some, not a huge amount, but 10% is really Trump specific. And which if one, th if Trump ever leaves the scene, does suggest that it might not be that hard to transfer to the next generation of Trumpists. And we've seen a little of that, of course, in 2022 yeah. uh, in the go governor's races there, uh, in, in states and Senate races in states like Pennsylvania and, and elsewhere. Um, and also we've seen it uh, in the primaries where DeSantis and Ramaswamy tried to be Trump. And so Trump has something. Trump is a very effective demagogue. One thing it tells me, though, and this would be, I think, cautionary for the Biden campaign. I was talking with someone about this a very senior Democrat over the weekend who, uh, unlike most of them, actually agreed with me on this. Trump is a very good candidate. I mean, I mean, he's terrible in so many ways and he's oh, yeah. ridiculous. And if he were more disciplined, he might be even better. But Trump is outperforming what a Republican with Trump's views should be getting. You know, well, he's even maybe outperforming what, what normie Republicans should be getting, right? It's not like normie Republicans were doing great in 2012 or 2008 and so forth. So, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's just a cautionary lesson against, against, uh, uh, you know, under, uh, against judging, against dismissing Trump or thinking that the craziness will certainly catch up with him or, or January 6th will catch up with him. And God knows it all should catch up with him, but people know all of that. And there's Trump in the numbers you read, basically ahead in, the, in in Arizona and even in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So the encouraging thing for me, looking at those numbers, I with I concurring with all of your all of the Biden concerns. So, you know, you can over over analyze this sort of stuff, but but just broadly speaking, uh, to me it looks like what we saw in 2016 and 2020 was a lot of the normie-ish Republican voters. Not we're not talking about elites now. Um, you know, there was still this delay and kind of moving over to that, right? Like the anti-Trump, never Trumpers are people, the actual voters. What you saw a lot of times was they were voting for say Gary Johnson, you know, in, in the presidential race or third party or something, and then still voting for the Republican for Senate, right? Cause across the board, Republicans were out performing Trump, at least in the competitive States in 2016 and, and in 2020. So was, you, you were, you were seeing this where people were like, yeah, they're leaving the party. But then, you know, in the midterms, you're seeing signs that a lot of these people are like, okay, this whole party is MAGA now, you know? And so this realignment to me, I look at this and say a lot of the realignment is happening, right? Like the people, the types of people that, that don't like Donald Trump, are now saying I'm voting for Ruben Gallego. You know, I think that there, you can just look at the Senate number and say it's pretty clear that there's a decent number of Ducey McCain flake voters. Uh, you know, that's the only way that Ruben, Ruben Gallego could be up by three against Kerry. Like they've already, 
you know, now they're not just never Trump, but they are never Trumpist. They're never MAGA. You know, maybe they'll vote for Larry Hogan in Maryland. So I, I think that's encouraging. So that means then who is the problem? Like, why is Trump doing better then? And, and to me, it seems very obvious that it's low propensity, low info voters, uh, working class voters, people that used to be Democrats, maybe younger voters, maybe, you know, types that don't vote in midterms, types that don't vote in in um, special elections. And and there's something about the Trump kind of brand. It's like this cultural signifier, Trump brand slash maybe inflation's part of it slash whatever, uh, slash what Biden's age. Like it's these types of voters that are that are helping Trump in the polls. Like, are those is Trump going to actually be able to turn those people out? Are those people still going to be? You know, these are the softest type of voters to have, right? And and I think that it's pretty obvious that that is the group that is booing Trump right now. If you look at any. You know, if you look at the cross tabs of any of these polls, and so that's, I think that's concerning for Democrats. If that's a permanent shift, right? If if it is like that, those low low propensity working class black voters, you know, Hispanic voters, younger voters, do kind of say, okay, I'm I'm into MAGA now. Like like they need to tend to that crop, but um, but I, I think that is driving the gap to me. Those voters are driving the gap. No, I totally agree, and I think I mean the, the good news is they're a little less they're less likely to vote. They might be just kind of indulging a kind of whim. They don't like Biden much as 81 years old and stuff, but they'll come back home, as people say, in, in September, October. The bad news is, so far at least, they're open to voting for Trump. I don't know what new information they're going to get about Trump right. that could scare them away. There, there could be some. I mean, I, I was talking to someone about this over the weekend, actually. I mean, he's doing pretty well among younger black voters. Are they really aware of what a racist Trump and his support is and, and how much his, his team supporters is. are just playing the race card flat out? And I got to think for even black voters who don't like Biden much and they have some economic stuff in common with Trump and inflation and all. I, I, so I... But I do think it requires work. I mean, it, yes. the idea, and I, this worries me a little about the Biden campaign, they do sort of seem to me have a, and this is very, very true of sort of liberals on Twitter, uh, you know, commentators, that so they just dis discount those numbers. They're not going to stick. I mean, how can you believe Trump's within six among Hispanics? That could never stand up. Uh, well, A, it may not stand up in future races, as you were saying, and, or down ballot, but could it stand up for Trump in 2024? I don't know. The Trump campaign is not stupid. I mean, they're going to be spending a lot of time messaging those voters. Yeah, for sure. And they think that's their possible margin of victory. They're looking at the exact same polls you just were looking at, right? And they're they're having the same thought process in reverse. So I think it really does require work by Biden. By the I Biden concur. Candidate. Okay, one more example of this type of voter. People are sometimes like, these guys don't exist. You know, the, the people that still need to be persuaded don't really exist. Well, they do uh, exist, and some of them are even in Trump's cabinet. Uh, former Trump Defense Secretary Mark Esper uh, said uh, late last week, there's no way I'll vote for Trump, but every day that Trump does something crazy, the door to voting for Biden opens a little bit more, and that's where I'm at. Uh, there is a shocking number of people for whom this is true. I just do. I just like... I, I know that this, my, to a daily bulwark podcast listener who we love, like this notion that, that you need another piece of evidence about Trump's craziness. But but there's a lot of people like that. Um, I hear from them, uh, former Republican friends. And, you know, you go through this cycle where something happens, a crazy thing happens. They're like, ugh, we can't do this guy anymore. And then kind of, you know, a week goes by, two weeks go by, and, and they start to come back into, well, maybe I could, or maybe I should just write in Erdman Burke or whatever. So I, I do think that this will be a continual fight to keep Trump's crazy on these people's face. What was your thought about the Esper comment? Totally. And we need to expand from never Trump to include never again Trump yeah. voters. And one the one of the best ways to speak never again Trump voters is what Sarah's doing with the testimonials from fellow never again Trump grassroots voters. Another way is by remind, telling all these never people who have a never again Trump inclination post January 6th, such as post, you know, looking at the chaos or post supporting Nikki Haley or whatever, that, you know what, a lot of respectable people whom you sort of admire are never again Trump. Mike Pence, Mark Esper, Chris Christie, they all supported Trump in 2020. They were like, but not supported, they were part of the administration. Um, so, you know, it, it's okay for you to not to not vote for the person you voted for twice. You've been through this. I mean, it's hard in politics. The best thing in politics to have is 
to have won the same race before, right? Because voters don't like to change their mind much. They don't like to acknowledge they were wrong. Right. And so if they voted for this person before, they're going to vote for this person again. That's why incumbent, one reason incumbents win so, you know, such a massive percentage of the time. Trump in this weird way is an incumbent, kind of. He's been on the ballot twice in a row. And so you know, never again Trump is a very important, maybe the most important way to pry away some Trump voters, some 2016 and 2020 Trump voters uh, to, to give margin, to give Biden the margin he probably needs, because he's got to be losing some 2020 Biden voters. If you're just an incumbent for four years, people do get annoyed at you in a way they're not when you're a challenger. So he needs those never again Trump voters. Indeed, indeed. Okay. Finally, let's move over to uh, the news out of Russia. Um, Kharkiv was under Russian missile attack over the uh, over the holiday weekend. Um the Congress is now finally coming back after uh, a lengthy spring break. Uh, and uh, Mike Johnson indicated Sunday night that uh, he will likely bring the Ukraine, Ukraine bill to the floor, but will include some innovations. Um, among the, quote, innovations are that some of the money is, turns into be a loan, um, that he wants to seize some Russian assets and give that to Ukraine instead of American money. Like, OK, whatever. He wants to tie it to natural gas exports. Like once you start getting into the details, that worries me about timing again. But great. Let, let's do more national gas exports on board on board with that. Chip Roy, um, uh, when he was asked about all this, said that uh, Johnson's survival does not begin with bringing a clean Ukraine aid bill to the floor. Uh, on the other side, Don Bacon says he has a commitment to get a foot vote. This guy seems way over his head. Uh, but I mean, the the news out of Ukraine, you know, shows the urgency once again. Yeah, totally. And I've got to say, most of the things he's talking about putting in there, I'd prefer a clean vote on the Senate bill just for the obvious sure. reason that Biden could sign it the next day and we could get the aid going. And it doesn't create all the possible complications that adding stuff does. Most of the actual things he's adding are kind of reasonable, I've got to say, at least the ones he's mentioned so far, including the, the loan. Yes. Well, the loan's kind of silly, but we'll forgive the loan probably, sort of like yeah. Lend-Lease, you know, and um, and the, the seizing of the assets is, is not trivial, and that, I'm for that. And, Same. and Biden could do it on his own, but it's probably better to have congressional cover. So, But look, I'm, I wish it were the clean thing. I mean, I got a, Congress comes back, the House comes back in a week, and I very much am in a trust but verify mode on this. And very important to say to Johnson, look, if you can get this through and pre-negotiate this in a sense with Schumer and get it to the Senate and Biden can sign it in four days, that's okay. But if not, you got to have that discharge petition in reserve. And I think people like Don Bacon have to be willing to say, OK, you got a week to work this out. But otherwise, we're going with a clean uh, one of the two clean bills that uh, other bills that are out there. That's also another complication. But one way or the other, we have to get it done in the next two or three weeks. The good news here uh, is that. The, once again, the Democrats are a responsible governing party. Maybe it's bad news. Actually, the Democrats don't get credit for this. But like right. the good news as far as getting the policy done is that Mike Johnson could put in like pretty much anything and it would still get signed. Right. I mean, like he could include a provision that's like we're going to repeal the transgender day of visibility <laughs> as part of this money. Don't give and him like, ideas. Of course, he'll put this in. And then the Democratic base will go crazy. Yeah. And then Biden will be but, pressured. But I stuff, mean, like, you know? literally, I, it's just like he's throwing stuff out there. He's throwing chum in. Like, what can I throw? What chum can I throw in the water? It's the same thing as the immigration bill. And the Democrats are like, fine, whatever. And, and you know, just given the Democratic Party's reputation and what we had come right. up with, like the notion that they're like, Yes, we will be the ones that, no matter how irresponsible you are, will be the ones that supports our ally with military aid, and will go along with your stupid games. Like, like that's noteworthy and deserves to be mentioned, and is and is a big reason why this could actually happen, right? Because otherwise, you get into a cluster, you know, where where you're negotiating back and forth, and nothing ever happens. The Democrats could mention this a little more. They've already done this. They passed the border bill. I mean, the right. border plus Ukraine bill in the yeah. Senate with, I think, two Democrats deserting or something like that. I mean, they provided the majority. The, we're not a re majority of Republicans for all these border provisions they claim to be for. So, I mean, they've already swallowed hard and passed stuff they didn't like. It's not even a theoretical question, right? And so it's funny how little they talk about that. Does anyone in America know that they actually passed tougher border protections than 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 people were talking about a few months ago, including even tougher than tough, pretty tough by Republican standards. Yeah, I feel like Democrats seen a little bit should more, talk like, more about that. Yeah, they did a good job the State of the Union, and and I do see this from Democratic senators a little bit more. But yeah, no, more is more is more, more is more on this front. Um, 
Uh, more is more will be true tonight also from Angel Reese on the on the backboards and in the hoop. And uh, I look forward to that, Bill. I hope you enjoy the, the game tonight and we will see you back here next Monday. 